the contest is not financially sustainable. That's the verdict of the EBU, according to Ireland's head of delegation, Michael Keeley, in an interview with the Aerovision podcast. Therefore, the powers that be are asking participating broadcasters to cough up yet greater sums of money to cover the soaring costs of keeping our beloved contest going. But what exactly is going on? Is Eurovision running out of money? And if so, what can be done about it? Why is participating at the contest becoming so much more expensive? Essentially, there are two main reasons, Russia and inflation. In 2022, Russia was expelled from participating at Eurovision due to the invasion of Ukraine. The member broadcasters subsequently withdrew from the EBU in a huff. And while not a member of the Big Five, the country did pay a pretty sizable participation fee. Now that Russia has left, this big financial black hole has had to be spread out among everybody else. Then there's just inflation in general. From energy to supplies, food to travel, everything is becoming more expensive. And that means the cost of producing the contest has gone up, the cost of traveling to the contest has gone up, and the cost of being accommodated and fed in the host city has also gone up. Bulgaria, Montenegro, and North Macedonia all pulled out of participating at the 2023 contest in Liverpool due to the increased cost, especially with regards to staying in the United Kingdom. So, what can be done about it? Well, no doubt small efficiencies can be made here and there. It'll all add up, and maybe the EBU have already done that. Indeed, despite the outcry from fan media and delegations, the press centre wasn't open during rehearsals at the 2023 contest, at least partly as a means to save money. But what further measures could be taken? Well, I asked on the community page and got plenty of interesting responses, some of which have been incorporated here along with my own observations. So thanks to all who gave the suggestions, let's explore some of them. The first is regards to sponsorships. Eurovision already has a number of sponsors, be it Moroccan Oil, TikTok, Baileys or government agencies. And while it may be quite feasible to include more, there will be a saturation point somewhere. Plus, many sponsors want more than just a bit of TV airtime in return, especially with the rise of social media content. For example, TikTok now provides exclusive online content, such as rehearsal footage, much to the chagrin of some. The EBU only have so many perks at their disposal to dish out to their sponsors. Another idea is to set up a sort of trust fund for less well-off countries. Fan communities such as OJ could organize fundraising events, the proceeds of which go into this trust fund. Then broadcasters who are struggling to keep up with the contest of participating at Eurovision can apply for a grant from this fund. Of course, the devil's in the detail and I'm no lawyer, but as a principle, surely the EBU could consider it. Now, is there a way of cutting back on the shows themselves? Well, without compromising on the quality of the production, it would be tricky. But one idea that was put forward was to revert to having just one semi-final. On the face of it, this would be problematic, to say the least, as there would be well over 30 countries. The length of the show would be similar to the grand final, and block voting would no doubt play havoc, at least in the minds of some. But these problems are not insurmountable. Could some extra countries receive automatic qualifications, say, based on the results in the previous contest? Could voters be barred from voting for countries in their pot, in the same way that you can't vote for your own country? All food for thought. Possibly the most feasible move would be to accept more associate members into the contest. With Australia having been part of the adult contest in recent years, and Kazakhstan making appearances at junior Eurovision, there is certainly precedent for this. Many fans are eager to see Kazakhstan participate in both shows, not just the little one. And of course, if we accept too many countries from beyond the confines of Europe, there is the danger that Eurovision morphs into World Vision, which is not particularly desirable as far as most people are concerned. However, surely we could look closer to home for new participants. Kosovo are keen to join, and the Faroe Islands have expressed an interest too. Then what about allowing the four nations of the United Kingdom to compete separately? Maybe the EBU could take another look at the rules of entry and make some tweaks to allow these to happen. In any case, things are looking positive for the return of Slovakia in 2025 and potentially Monaco too, and if they do, that will certainly help. Ultimately, we only have a limited perspective of these things, not being privy to all the cogs and belts of the mighty machine that is the Eurovision Song Contest. And by its very nature, it's going to be expensive to put on. Having an arena for the best of two months, but with most of that time being for set construction and rehearsals, is woefully inefficient, as is having largely redundant backups for everything. But what can the EBU do about it? 
Well, unless they want to start ticketed tours of Eurovision stage construction, which would be a health and safety nightmare, nothing. But there's no doubt that at a time when broadcasters and indeed the fans are having their budget squeezed tighter and tighter, rather than constantly asking for more and more cash to keep the wheels turning, maybe the EBU could do more to make the machine run a little bit more efficiently and even strip it back just a bit. And that is a way to make Eurovision more financially sustainable.